Imagine how you would feel if you came home from this conference and your house was in bits on the ground. I'm starting with this thought, partly because in the excitement of working with archival sources or other interesting data, it's easy to forget that there are real people's lives and often real people's deaths behind it. Pictures like this one reflect the reality of Second World War bombing. They also prompt us to recall that the Blitz spirit still has a prominent place in British culture, or, if you like, in the national consciousness. But even though there is a large amount of interest in bombing, and especially in the London Blitz, it isn't an easy topic to research. There are many possible sources, and this table on, on screen just shows just a small sample of records from the National Archives. The archival sources range from the very official to the very personal, from the very detailed to the very broad brush, and from the purely textual to visual sources like photographs, drawings, and maps. As we all know, um, most people aren't very familiar with using archives, and they aren't always prepared for how complex and even um, messy, in some cases, records and histor historical data can be. So add to this the fact that um, different records relating to one bombing incident may be held in different archives, most historical records aren't digitised, and many of them aren't catalogued in much detail, um, if at all. So in short, doing research involves actually doing research. And although none of this is at all surprising to any other of us here today, it can come as a horrible shock to inexperienced would-be users of archives how complicated and time-consuming research can be. The original records aren't really hidden, of course, far from it, but they are effectively hidden to the majority of people who lack basic hist historical research skills. So... This is where our project comes in. It hasn't solved everyone's research problems, of course it hasn't, but it does represent quite a significant step towards wider and easier access to data about the London Blitz. It has produced an interactive website, bombsite.org, and um, a related Android app, both based on selected bomb sensors maps from TNA and other historical data about the Blitz. These provide a resource for academic researchers and for the university's geography teaching, as well as for the public at large, or in the current jargon, citizen researchers. And certainly in the sessions that I've been to, nobody's actually used the jargon citizen researchers so far, which surprised me in a way. Okay. So, the project has been led by my invisible co-presenter, co Dr Kate Jones of the University of Portsmouth, in partnership with TNA and funded by JISC. Is anyone from JISC here? Well, thank you anyway, Jisk, we love you very much. <laughs> and this is the Vogue's gallery, which I'll just skip over quickly. Kate, Kate is the one next to me, in case you were wondering what she looks like. Okay. The core data for our project is taken from scanned copies of two sets of bomb sensors maps compiled by the Ministry of Home Security, one covering a single week in a lot of detail and the other covering the eight-month period of the Blitz in much less detail. A small group of Kate students painstakingly geolocated every single one of them from those maps by hand. There are various supplementary data sets too, which I don't really have time to go into now. But I will just say that the underlying modern data that makes it work comes from OpenStreetMap and various clever bits of open source, sof so open source software. As you might have guessed, I wasn't the technical person on this project, and some of the final details of, the, of, of exactly how it works are a little bit beyond me. If you are interested in the full details, please do take a look at the website. But in layman's terms, we started off with this, and we ended up with this. So that's just a very quick overview. What I want to talk about now, really, are um, engagement and impact. And I don't mean the impact of the bombing itself, great and terrible as that was. And I always think that images like this are, 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 are worth looking at. Or even the um, st statistical impact of the project. So impressive as these figures are, more than one and a quarter million hits, I think, yes, um, isn't bad going for a very small academic project with no marketing budget. But what I I've, I've really want to concentrate on is the qualitative angle. And I'm going to divide this into three aspects, which I'm calling technology, geography, and user engagement. So, so Bombsite uses new technology to bring hidden historical data to life. It's also enriched that data by making it searchable and browsable in a different way. It's allowed many people to access the data without visiting the archives in person. And this also means without any wear and tear on the original maps. So it's a win-win for access and preservation. 
the university also has a tool for introducing uh, its students to working with spatial data and developing their skills. And we hope that this will also inspire some of them to do their own work with hi historical data in the future. So moving on to geography, I, I sh should have said at the beginning that um, Kate is based in the geography department and her original research interests are in um, cultural geography with a bit of a historical bent, but not much. Okay. So, uh, geography. Um, accessing maps on a smartphone is now an everyday activity for many people. Not me, because my phone is an antique, but quite a lot of people. And, and the um, te technology to make um, maps work on mobiles is, is now pretty, pretty much mature. Also, a couple of years ago, a buzz about spatial data began to emerge among <coughs> academics in subjects outside of geography. So, all in all, there's a lot of interest in using interactive mapping and in similar concepts like interactive timelines to link together different data, often relating to the same place. So, Bombsite uses it, off, offers a geographical framework for studying the impact of bombing more widely, such as its social and economic aspects. A map specialist at TNA have long been keen to emphasise that maps are useful for many different research topics. Although some people using our maps are scholars or students of history of cartography, many others, and in fact most of them aren't. They're studying other research topics and maps just come into it in a small way. In fact, archives in all formats are useful for a variety of academic disciplines, not just for straight history. And as we heard earlier in this session, something like um, seals, which are another very visual source, very much the same thing applies to them as to our maps or, or plans or photographs. So the um, Bombsite project is a good example of archives as a source for geography. So in terms of engaging with the public, when developing any kind of online product, it's vital to consider user needs very seriously both before and during development. And in the case of our project, a lot of time and thought went into devising scenarios for use, into the um, design of the site itself, and into focused user testing to make sure that the results matched Kate's original vision in particular. Another very powerful tool was social media, especially the use of Twitter to make people aware of the project and, and its website. In fact, in our case, this was perhaps a little bit too effective, and I'll come back to that shortly. We also decided to embed ourselves into parts of TNA's existing public engagement work. I wrote about the site for TNA's blog, which is in addition to the project's own blog. And Kate also gave a lecture for the um, public, public, regular public talks program at TNA, which is now available on TNA's website as a podcast if you'd like to listen. I believe she's also put the slides from her talk up on SlideShare, and she's, so it's, it's, it should be possible to listen to her talk and um, watch the slides at the same time. Um, Bombsite as a whole offers a pretty clear example of how an academic project can both respond to and drive public interest in historical events, in this case the London Blitz, and, we hope, in historical sources too. By creating the site, we've managed to raise awareness of archival sources like the bomb sensors maps, not just among the general public, but, all, but also among people who love spatial data and potentially have the technical skills to do great things with it. So interestingly, it was this zoomed out image of the whole of London that, that um, captured the public imagination. And this is the one that was featured on news websites various at the time of the launch. Now, this actually came as a surprise to us. Kate tells me that to an academic geographer's mind, this particular image is neither very stimulating nor very meaningful. But it did make a lot of people go, wow. <laughs> there were an awful lot of bombs, weren't there? <laughs> Actually, the um, public reaction overall has mostly been very positive. I won't say it's been 100% positive in every case, because that, that wouldn't be true, but it has mostly been very positive. And in fact, judging by the, the, these, these, these quotes, which um, Kate, Kate, Kate took from Twitter, the fairly common reactions are, firstly, that people are shocked by just how many bombs there were. They're also interested and excited to see that bombs fell near their homes or where their families used to live, or that it um, um, explains why a, particular, uh, a, few, a few houses in their street are much more modern than all the others. And that they also think that history, geography and technology are a cool and effective combination, and I have to say that I agree. Okay. Yeah. Bombsite attracted far more media coverage than we had expected, or, to be strictly honest, than we were prepared for. It made the front page of the BBC News website and of the Daily Mail online, and featured in the news across the world. Kate was interviewed in her kitchen for BBC and ITV News, an experience that she describes as surreal. <laughs> but of course, projects like ours aren't all plain sailing. 
This was Kate's first project as principal investigator, and it was my first partnership project working with an academic, and it was a fairly steep learning curve for both of us in, in some ways. For instance, the um, bu bu bureaucracy attached to getting an academic partnership approved at CNA isn't excessive by any means, but the process is quite formidable for a first time, which was me. Um, Top-level approval and buy-in is very necessary, though, because all of the partners are staking some of their reputations on the project being successful. We at CNA are very proud of our reputation in public task, and indeed our branding, and we don't go into partnership with just anybody. Fortunately for me, Kate was admirably unfazed by the whole process. In, in, um, in fact, she was far more relaxed about it than I was. It's, it's worth mentioning at this point that the war was actually not so very long ago, and of course some sources from that time are still in copyright, which um, did restrict some of what we could do. Fortunately, a lot of TNA records are crown copyright, which makes things a lot easier. And my colleagues in our licensing department, who are unfailingly helpful, offer non-commercial academic licenses free of charge, so the funding only has to cover the cost of, the cost of um, supply, supplying digital images and not the cost of licensing them. The um, supplementary sources from elsewhere were also free to use, so Kate didn't need to spend her precious budget on licensing fees at all. Yeah. I've mentioned before that historical data is always messy, but this is not just any data, it's wartime data. The, bomb, the Ministry of Home Security's bomb sensors maps were compiled under difficult conditions and some time pressure, so it's not surprising that the results were sometimes inconsistent. The process of transforming the paper maps into digital data, which is itself pretty complicated, also had potential for introducing further inaccuracies into the final results. Getting historical maps to match up to modern ones, as I've just said, is a complex process, and the result is always a bit of a compromise. And then there's the potential for errors when geolocating the individual bombs. And finally, the open street map layer that we were using is a crowdsourced product itself, and it's not error-free, particularly in the street name and postcode searching. And I've had a few sort of interesting phone conversations with elderly people who insist that we've made mistakes when it's the postcodes that's gone, gone, gone wrong on open street map, and there's not a great deal we can do about it. Okay, so this is just an example of how the digitised maps don't match up perfectly. Academic geographers take things like this in their stride and virtually for granted, but it can come as a bit of a surprise to other users. Yeah. Nowadays, digital preservation, as we all know, is a very serious business, and we had to make sure that the data has a long-term future. The newly created data has been kept in sustainable formats, such as GeoGIF, with sensible metadata, and it's also being deposited with <coughs> Digimap and ShareGeo. In the short term, another type of sustainability proved a bit more of a challenge. When the site's soft launched at the beginning of last December, a few people noticed it and tweeted about it. And pretty soon, some um, celebrity tweeters picked up on it. These were people like um, Dara O'Brien and Stephen Mangan, and a couple of others. And after that, it fairly rapidly went viral. The university's servers struggled to cope with the sudden increase in demand, and for a while on the 7th of December, which was the busiest day with um, all the news stories, the site was down. An organisation called Cloudflare came to our rescue and waved a te te technological magic wand. I, 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 told, I told you I wasn't a technical person on this, this project. To keep, it, to keep the site going through the high interest period. And so thanks to their support, computer meltdowns ceased and the public were able to make use of the site as we intended. I should point out that the young lady featured on that site isn't a genuine user. It's my colleague Deb Debbie, Debbie who was posing for a picture on TNA's website that I've just borrowed. <laughs> But that's all in the past. There is a lot more that we could do to develop site further. For instance, we could expand the date range to cover the whole blitz period, or even the whole war, in fuller detail. We could capture additional details, such as the numbers, number of casualties, from contemporary reporting forms. Or we could expand to other parts of the UK. So, to give you some, uh, some idea of the amount of records involved, we've done two portfolios worth, and there are another 86. We might um, also try to crowdsource at least some of the capture information and maybe even invite people to contribute their own memories, photos, or other information. And in fact, some people who've used the site have already asked, asked if they could do that at some point. Further work might also lead to devising a framework to help smaller archives develop their own mapping applications if there is demand for that. That was one of Kate's ideas, and I'd be interested to know if there, if, 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 if there is demand for that from the rest of the archive sector. We, we can't do all of those things, but whatever we do do, it will involve applying for some kind of additional funding from somewhere. So um, watch this space.